the presentation. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm Jenna Lacqua. I'm executive director of the History Project, and we are Boston's LGBTQ community archives. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, we document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history um, by bringing in collections to the archives, by working with researchers and community members to uh, gain access to that history and to um, share the, the stories that we've collected as far and wide as we can during these times. We've done a lot of virtual events and I really encourage you to go check out our YouTube channel. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. We did a really excellent one last night, actually our first in-person event in a year and a half with the LGBT elders of color uh, where they did a storytelling event. So I'll share that with you all. Um, I'd like to do a quick plug. We do have um, our big yearly events, our History Maker Awards coming up this November. We're planning for November 4th. We're currently planning in person, but we will see uh, you know, if, if we'll need to pivot in these uh, ongoing pandemic times. But I'm so excited that we'll be able to honor the uh, lifetime work of lawyer John Ward, who is the founder of GLAAD, and the uh, continued and current activist work of Triandre Valentine, who is the executive director of the Mass Trans Political Coalition. So you'll get some more information about that as well. Um, and I think those are all my history project plugs for the evening. Uh, so now it's really my honor to introduce you to Peter Muse. Uh, Peter is a, a local author, um, and he is the author of very recently published Witches and Warlocks of Massachusetts. Uh, he is an avid folklore fan, a New England native who blogs at New England Folklore, um, and also the author of, this is, oh, Legends and Lore of the North Shore. I didn't have the second title bolded for me. Um, Peter tonight is going to explore the intersection of sex, queer people, and witchcraft in Massachusetts history and folklore, discuss his new book, and we'll have some time at the end for, for a talk back in Q&A. So if folks, um, feel free to leave your camera on if you would like to, um, but stay muted until that Q&A if you don't mind, and then we'll, we'll all chat together at the end. And with that, I turn it over to you, Peter. Great, thank you, Joan. And uh, Joan has graciously offered to help me run my, my slideshow, which I greatly appreciate. Um, so Joan, if you wanna put up the slideshow, that'd be great. We'll start with the first slide. Um, all right, just give me a second here. Can you see that? Does it look okay? It looks good. Okay, perfect. Let my presentation so I can see that and I'm ready to go. Okay, so uh, good evening everybody. As Joan said, my name is Peter Muse. Uh, I'm gonna talk with you tonight about witches, sex and queer people in Massachusetts from let's say 1644 to 2021. And these are some of my favorite topics. Everyone likes witches, sex and queer people. So I'm excited to share interesting historical information, local legends, and possibly a little gossip about the sex lives of historical figures. And as Joan mentioned, if you wanna submit questions via the chat function, I'll try to answer those when my presentation ends. So just a little bit about me, Joan, if you can go to slide two. Um, I was born in Haverhill, Massachusetts and have been interested in folklore and legends and myths pretty much my entire life. And I've been writing about New England's folklore for quite a few years. I started with a blog, New England Folklore, in 2008, and I still update that blog several times a month. And so I often imagine this blog being like one of these musty old archaic tomes bound in leather that you see in a horror movie, because I feel like a 13-year-old blog is a pretty old blog. But it does have a lot of interesting information in it, so check it out if you get the chance. Joan, if, next slide, please. Uh, in 2014, I published Legends and Lore of the North Shore with the History Press. I've also had pieces published in 13 Most Haunted Crime Scenes Beyond Boston and in Magical Folk, British and Irish Fairies 500 AD to the Present. So I had a chapter in that book about um, fairy folklore in New England. Uh, next slide. Most recently and most relevant to tonight's talk, I'm also the author of Witches and Warlocks of Massachusetts, which Joan mentioned. This was just published by Globe Pequot on September 1st. I'm pretty excited about this book. It's a collection of historical witch trial accounts, local legends and folklore, and even some contemporary paranormal encounters that people have reported. 
So there are more than 70 different stories in the book from many cities and towns across the Commonwealth, plus several sections just about the Salem witch trials. And so it's, I really wanted, as I had been reading about folklore, I really wanted a book that had all the witch stories in one place and that just didn't exist. So I just kind of put it together myself. So that's the origin of this book. And so the book is targeted to a general audience, but for tonight's talk, I'm highlighting the sections that are most relevant to an audience interested in queer history. Plus I'm presenting some special material that's not found in the book. And just to be clear, I don't have a grand theory connecting witches, sex, and queer people. Some people might, I don't. Um, I'm more interested in stories and stories about these topics. So instead of a grand theory, I'm gonna share some interesting stories that show how these three categories uh, overlap in Massachusetts across about four different centuries. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna cover three different historical eras tonight. Um, I'm gonna to talk about the Puritan era. There were 50 years of witchcraft ac ac accusations and trials in Massachusetts in the 1600s, ending with the Salem witchcraft trials. And this was when witchcraft was a crime and very serious business. I'm also gonna talk about the 18th and 19th century. There were no longer any witchcraft trials. And although belief was fading, some people at this time still believed in witches. So there's a lot of interesting legends and stories from this time. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the modern era. And there are still legends being told about witches in Massachusetts today, but people talk about them as paranormal encounters or as ghost stories. And these stories, these paranormal encounters are often tied to certain spooky locations that people go to visit. And so I'll dive into that a little bit. For each of these eras, I'll give an overview of sort of the witchcraft beliefs or legends from that time. Then I'll highlight some sexual aspects of those beliefs or legends, and then I'll discuss the queer people associated with them. And just sort of a caveat, I, as people know, it can be difficult to accurately identify queer people in the past for many different reasons. So what I present will mostly be speculation, and some of it is from historians, and a little bit is from me myself. Um, Joan, next slide, please. And there we go. Uh, so what is a witch? It's a word with a lot of different definitions. For the purposes of tonight's talk, I'm using this sort of older classical definition that a witch is someone who causes harm through magical means. I'm not talking about Wiccans or other folks who practice magic today. Uh, that's a religious tradition or a spiritual path. And it's very different, I think, from how our cultural ancestors in New England would have thought about witches in the past. I'm also not gonna talk about the magic and witchcraft beliefs of the Native Americans from this area, since that's a much more complicated subject. Next slide, please, Joan. So let's start, um, we'll start with the Puritans. Massachusetts was colonized by English Puritans in the 1600s. Plymouth was founded in 1620, Salem in 1626, Boston in 1630, Haverhill in 1640, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this was almost 400 years ago and well before the enlightenment and well before the scientific revolution really took place. To put the Puritans in historical perspective, some of the early colonists could have seen Shakespeare's plays performed live on stage for the first time. Like they could have seen The Tempest for the first time ever. So this is a long time ago. This is basically the late Renaissance. And so when we talk about that era, we're talking about people who had very different beliefs than we have now. I also wanna note that many of the Puritan colonists came from part of England called East Anglia. And this is an area where there was a very strong belief in witches. The biggest witch hunts in England happened in East Anglia. And so it's no big surprise, I think, that the biggest witch hunts in America happened here in New England, which was settled by the East Anglians. And basically they brought their witchcraft beliefs across the ocean with them. Next slide, please. The, uh, the Massachusetts Puritans took witchcraft very, very seriously. And in 1641, they passed a law making witchcraft a capital crime punishable by death. And here it is on the screen. If any man or woman be a witch that is hath or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. And there are some citations from the Bible lending validity to their law. Uh, and as you can see from that law, the word witch was applied to both men and women but additional terms are also sometimes used for men like 
conjurer, wizard, necromancer, things like that. And one interesting note, this law against witches was written on the same page of the law book as the law against sodomy. And um, much like witchcraft, sodomy was also punishable by death at this time. Um, slide nine, Joan, next slide, please. So the Puritans, it was believed that witches were motivated mainly by anger, greed, and jealousy. And they used their evil magical powers to cause suffering for their neighbors. They disrupted households by cursing livestock, hexing butter churns and spinning wheels and looms and making food turn rotten. Uh, they caused strange phenomena like doors opening on their own, mysterious noises with no obvious cause and objects flying around the room all by themselves. So basically similar to what a modern person might call poltergeist activity. It, the Puritans would have blamed those sorts of things on witches. And lastly, they tormented, killed and sickened men, women and children. The Puritan clergy who were sort of the, you know, the top of the hierarchy in Massachusetts, the Puritan clergy thought that witches had these evil powers because they had made a deal with the devil. But the average Puritan didn't necessarily share this perspective. To the average Puritan in Massachusetts, witches were more or less just part of life to them. And they're sort of a problem that had to be endured or dealt with. And I also wanna highlight, um, it was widely believed that witches were served by small demons called familiar spirits. And that was mentioned in the 1640 law, right? Half or consulteth a familiar spirit. So witches, it was often believed were served by these small demons called familiar spirits. And they often took the shape of animals like cats or goats or birds. But some familiar spirits also were sort of these monstrous human animal hybrids, like you know a rooster with a monkey's face and human hands or something like that. It was believed that witches had to feed their familiar spirits with their own blood, and the familiar spirits suckled their blood through witch teats on their bodies. And um, this is probably the origin of the phrase, which you may have heard, colder than a witch's tit, right? How's the weather out? Oh, it's colder than a witch's tit. Um, this is because witch teats were supposed to be cold and insensitive to pain. And often during a trial, witches were examined to see if they had any unusual protuberances on their bodies. Like these were believed to be their witch teats, but in reality, these are just things like pimples or moles or just skin tags or whatever. Next slide, please. So in 1641, that law was passed, making witchcraft a capital crime. In 1644, Governor John Winthrop wrote in his diary about an alleged necromancer who had died in Boston Harbor. The alleged necromancer had been a crew member on a ship from Virginia, which exploded in the harbor when someone accidentally fired a pistol into its gunpowder supply. So lots of people on the ship died. All of their bodies were found except for that of this alleged necromancer. And on January 18th, a few days after the ship sank, people in Boston reported seeing strange glowing lights floating above the harbor. And at times the lights formed the shape of a man which roamed above the harbor. And at other times they just sort of flew around and emitted sparks and flames into the air. And John Winthrop also noted in his diary that people heard something, they heard this voice and he writes the following, about the same time, a voice was heard upon the water between Boston and Dorchester, calling out in a most dreadful manner, boy, boy, come away, come away, and suddenly shifted from one place to another at a great distance, about 20 times. It was heard by diverse godly persons. And the implication here that Winthrop is making is that the voice was the devil's voice, and he had come to take away the soul of the dead necromancer. And eventually these mysterious phenomena stopped and it was therefore believed the devil had found the necromancer and dragged him off to hell. And I bring this up, this 1644 account, because this is one of the earliest accounts of a witch in Massachusetts. And as you can, can see, this is almost 50 years before the Salem witch trials. Um, next slide, please, Joan. Now, just to be clear, there were no real witches in New England during the Puritan era. The people who were accused of witchcraft were people, usually women, who were eccentric or unpopular with their neighbors for a variety of reasons and wound up being accused of witchcraft. Between 1620 and 1691, 
there were at least 83 trials for witchcraft in New England, uh, 50 in Massachusetts, and most of the rest in Connecticut, which was sort of the other big Puritan stronghold in North America. Uh, so this is before the Selma witch trials even happened in 1692. From those 83 trials, 11 people were executed, and five of them, all of them women, uh, lived in Massachusetts. And next slide, please. So the women in Massachusetts um, who were executed were Margaret Jones, Alice Lake, Elizabeth Kendall, Anne Hibbins, and Goody Mary Glover, um, who was hanged in Boston in 1688. And just a note here about Goody. Um, Goody was not her first name. Goody is short for good wife, which was a term similar to Mrs. that was used in the 17th century. And Goody Glover's first name is not known, but tradition says it was Mary. And you'll hear the term goody come up quite often when, we, when you talk about Puritan society in New England. Puritan society placed really strict rules for behavior on women. And some of these women who were executed as witches broke those gender rules in some way or another. For example, Anne Hibbins was a very wealthy and privileged woman, but was very argumentative and had actually been excommunicated from the Puritan church in Boston for being so argumentative. Uh, Goody Glover was also argumentative, and she was also Irish Catholic in an English Puritan town. So there's some, those are some strikes against her already. Alice Lake had sex before marriage. She became pregnant from that sex, and then she tried to give herself an abortion. Um, she failed, and she married the father of her child and raised that child. But those past transgressions were remembered by her neighbors, and they influenced her view, their view of her as a sinful person. So, and similarly, uh, finally, Margaret Jones of Charlestown, she worked as a healer, and some women healers often came into conflict with male physicians over patients and who got to determine the cause and the treatment and things like that. It's not entirely clear if that's what led to the witchcraft accusations with Margaret, but definitely being a, a woman healer had its risks. And finally, I'll just say that Elizabeth Kendall doesn't quite fit the pattern. Um, and documentation is really sketchy for her trial. We only have like one account of it from our reverend's journal. Um, we do know she was accused of killing a family's newborn baby through, through witchcraft. She was executed for it. Um, but after her execution, it was later discovered that the baby really died because its nurse left it outside in the cold too long and it got sick. So Elizabeth Kendall may not quite fit this pattern of women transgressing or breaking the strict rules pace placed on them by Puritan society. Next slide, please, Joan. Obviously, the most famous Puritan witch trials in Massachusetts were those that happened in Salem in 1692. Over 150 people were accused and 19 people were executed. And of those 19, 14 were women and five were men. In addition to those 19, one man died while being tortured and three women and one man also died while they were in prison. So this was a really big tragedy and this is a much bigger witch trial than the ones that came before it. And I'll touch a little bit on some of those reasons in a bit, but just this was much larger than anything that came before it. And next slide, please. Of those 14 women who were executed, several had transgressed sexual norms before they were tried for witchcraft. And these tra past transgressions were probably one reason they were even considered to be witches in the first place. In a Puritan worldview, it's a short road from premarital sex, which they called fornication, to witchcraft, right? It's, you're already down the road to sin, so it's just a matter of time before you're signing your name in the devil's book and becoming a witch, right? Um, so Sarah Wilds had previously been whipped for fornication she wore expensive clothing that was, you know, sort of above someone of her uh, status in society, which was not, which was frowned upon. And she scandalously married her husband only months after his previous wife's death. So those are her transgressions. Bridget Bishop was also a flashy dresser. Um, many men described her distinctive red bodice in their testimony when they accused her of witchcraft. She argued publicly with her husband, and she was actually rumored to have murdered one of her past husbands. Martha Corey 
had sex before she was married with a black man and had a child from that marriage. And although that child was adopted by her subsequent husband and accepted into their families, that was still remember that she had you know, fornicated before marriage. Sarah Osborne, uh, she hired a handsome young male servant to live on her farm after her husband died. And although they later got married, sort of neighbors in Salem Village knew or suspected that you know, she was having sex with the handsome young male servant. And finally, Anne Pudiator, um, she had been questioned by local magistrates when a woman she was caring for died under strange circumstances. And Anne then married the widowed husband really quickly afterwards. So some people thought perhaps she had murdered the, his previous wife. So as you can see, many of the, these women all kind of transgressed, particularly sexual norms. And that's five out of the 14 who were accused, who were executed. Many other women executed also transgressed other Puritan behavioral norms. They were cantankerous, they were demanding, et cetera, et cetera. But these in particular had transgressed sexual norms. Um, and it's interesting to know that the five men who were executed for witchcraft had not transgressed sexual norms like the women had. And I think that is obviously because women were held to a much stricter standard, I think, than the men were. Next slide, please. This one has a great graphic. Everybody, that's a, a racy graphic there. Um, so this, I, you know, did anybody have sex with the devil, right? This is a question that I'm supposed is on everybody's mind at this moment, because this was a common accusation in European witchcraft trials. And European witchcraft trials often include descriptions of sort of these orgiastic witches' sabbaths. And at these Sabbaths, it was said the witches had sex with the devil or with various demons. And so that was sort of a continental European thing, these witches' Sabbaths that were basically big devilish orgies. However, I think much like the Puritans themselves, the New England witches, the alleged New England witches, were supposed to be more restrained and more modest, right? And so the New England witch Sabbaths were called witch meetings. And they were really very similar to a Sunday Puritan church service, but with a devil presiding over it instead of a minister. They were not these sort of racy orgiastic things you would read about in um, European witch trials. But still, despite this, um, there were three witchcraft trials that do include mention of sex with the devil. So I thought I would share these with you. So in 1653, Elizabeth Godman of New Haven, Connecticut, and she's not in Massachusetts, but I thought it was interesting enough to throw this in here. Um, Elizabeth Godman was a widow and she sued one of her neighbors, Goodwife Larimore, for defamation um, because Goody Larimore had said that Elizabeth Godman was a witch and that she had hobo mock for a husband. So what does that mean? Um, well, hobo mock is the name of a local Algonquin Indian god who was associated with darkness, disease, swamps, snakes, inclement weather, things like that. And so when the Puritans came to New England and they learned about Hobomach from the Algonquins, they erroneously assumed that Hobomach was actually the devil. And of course the Algonquins disagreed with this, but the name Hobomach was sometimes used to refer to the Christian devil in New England in the 17th century. So when Goody Larimore is saying that Elizabeth Godman is married to Hobomock, she's saying Elizabeth Godman is married to the devil and presumably having sex with him. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth Godman sued for defamation. She didn't win. And she was in fact later imprisoned and charged with the crime of witchcraft. So clearly a lot of the people in New Haven agreed with Goody Larimore that Elizabeth Godman was a witch. Happily, Elizabeth Godman was not found guilty um, but during her trial, some neighbors testified they had witnessed invisible beings when these invisible beings were either the devil or perhaps just familiar spirits sucking on Elizabeth Godman's body. So again, there's some sexual imagery here and it's also probably the familiar spirits like sucking her blood through the witch teeth. This next case, um, Goodwife Holmes, and she lived in Marsh Marshfield, Massachusetts. So in 1661, Dinah Sylvester, a woman named Dinah Sylvester, who lived in Marshfield, accused her neighbor, Goodwife Holmes, of being a witch. And Dinah Sylvester also testified that she once saw Goody Holmes talking in the woods with the devil who was in the shape of a bear. Okay, this is kind of a normal witchcraft accusation, right, more or less. But then Dinah Sylvester also claimed that at another time, 
she saw Goodwife Holmes transform herself into a bear. And then the devil appeared also as the shape of a bear and had sex with Goody Holmes and about a stone's throw from the highway as Dinah Sylvester said. So just right off the road where anybody could see it happening. So one of the magistrates who was hearing this testimony asked what type of tail this devilish bear had. Like he wanted some details. What's the devil's bear tail look like? Dinah Sylvester said she couldn't tell since it was facing towards her. The other, it was facing towards her as it had sex with Goodwife Holmes. So basically it's like behind Goodwife Holmes and both bears are like facing the road and facing Dinah Sylvester as they're going at it. Um, you know, and some of the testimony here was blacked out in subsequent uh, record because it was just so sexually explicit. Um, no one else came forward to testify against Goodwife Holmes. Like Dinah Sylvester was on her own here. No one else thought Goodwife Holmes was a witch. Uh, and the case was dropped. And in fact, Goodwife Holmes was then found guilty of slander. And she was sentenced to either be whipped for lying or to pay three pounds. But the court offered her another option. She could publicly admit that she lied, which she did. And that was the end of the case there. So that's case number two, sex with the devil. Number three, um, Rebecca Eames of Andover, Massachusetts. Um, she was arrested for witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. And she confessed that 26 years earlier in 1666, the devil had appeared to her as a colt, like as a small horse, and led her to a pond where he baptized her as a witch. After this unholy baptism, she signed her name in the devil's book. And she said she was overcome with the, the remorse at this act of adultery and even considered suicide. Um, and in this case, I think this sexual aspect is more ambiguous like, was it an act of physical adultery? Did she actually have sex with the devil here? Or is this merely a case of spiritual adultery? It's unclear, but either way, she's using adultery, which has a certain um, sexual connotation to it. Um, she later recanted her confession and said she was pressured into it to avoid execution, so, which was a common thing during the Selmwich trials. Many people confessed just to avoid the gallows. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on, um, men were also accused of witchcraft during the Puritan era, but not at the same rate as women. And this brings me to John Godfrey, who was accused of witchcraft four times during his life, four times. And at least one historian has also speculated that he was gay. So here's our person, first possible queer person of the night. John Godfrey emigrated to Massachusetts alone in 1635 when he was probably just a teenager. And not much is known about his background, but we do know, that, do know that he found work across Essex County as a herdsman for various wealthy landowners. Unlike most other Puritan men, he never married and he never settled in one place for very long. Right? He never settled in one place for very long, which was quite unusual for the time. Uh, historians also know from court records that he was very argumentative and he boasted to several people that he was a witch. It was dangerous to claim to be a witch in the Puritan era, but some men did this in order to give themselves a tough guy reputation. And Godfrey first boasted of being a witch way back in 1640, when he told a carpenter he had made an absolute bargain with a mysterious man he wouldn't name. And the carpenter asked if this mystery man were the devil. And in reply, Godfrey skipped around and said, I profess, I profess, right? So he's like skipping around like you caught me. I will note though that some historians think Godfrey said, I profess. Some historians think he said, I protest. Um, so this confusion over how to interpret a word that John Godfrey spoke will show up again in a few seconds or so. So Godfrey was accused of being a witch in 1658, 1659, 1666 and 1669. Co-workers, neighbors, and acquaintances all testified against him repeatedly. And one man said Godfrey had a teat hidden under his tongue so familiar spirits could nurse themselves with his blood. So picture him basically feeding his familiar spirits. Basically they would have been French kissing, right? The familiar spirits like, ah, sticking its tongue down under his tongue to get that blood out. And uh, several people testified that one of his familiars was a large black bird. So picture like this large black bird sticking his beak down his mouth there. Now I'm gonna talk a little about this bird and just a warning here, I'm, I'm gonna use an obscenity and the obscenity is actually in the witchcraft trial accounts from this time in the testimony. 
So in the testimony, a teenage boy named John Remington of Haverhill testified that he was attacked by a large black bird after his father argued with John Godfrey about some cattle. And the bird came and spooked the horse that John Remington was riding. John Remington fell off and he was injured. And I think the horse may have even landed on him, right? And so while he was recovering from his injuries, John Godfrey came to visit this teenage boy, John, Rem John Remington, and John Godfrey said the following. He said that every cock eating boy must ride. I unhorsed one the other day and I will unhorse thee too shortly if thee rides my horse. So clearly there's some very unsubtle threat there. And there's also kind of a weird sexual undertone. So next slide, please, Joan. Now, the historian John Demos, who's a well-known historian of the Salem witch trials and other witch trials, John Demos has speculated that John Godfrey was gay, based in part on the use of his, this word cock eating, right? It's a homoerotic insult. And Demos also thinks Godfrey could have been gay or the 17th century equivalent. Again, we can, it's hard to determine you know, people in the past, but um, Godfrey also could have been gay because he never married and never settled down, which was extremely rare. Like Puritan society was based on the family unit or the extended family, but not on the individual just doing going on his own. So it's entirely possible this is the case, right? He certainly was an unusual person for that time. I will point out though that another historian, David Hall, who is another respected historian of the witch trials, historian David Hall thinks the word was really cock aiding, which he speculates meant cocky or overly proud. Um, but David Hall does note that this word doesn't appear in any dictionaries from that time or any time since. So it's purely speculative if cock eating was really a word. So um, maybe it really was just cock eating. Maybe it was like, you cock eating boy, you messed with me and this is what happened to you. So I think whether or not he was gay or the 17th century equivalent of gay, John Godfrey was tried for witchcraft four times, but he was never found guilty. And uh, these four trials were only a small fraction of the trials he was part of. Godfrey was involved in more than 130 separate court cases during his life, both as a defendant and a plaintiff for petty crimes like slander and uncollected debts. So that's a lot of court cases, right? 130 is a lot. And perhaps he wasn't found guilty of witchcraft because the magistrates realized that he wasn't really a witch, but he was just a troublemaker. So John Godfrey died in 1675. He left his estate, which included money, some oxen and 100 acres of land in Haverhill to two men who had helped him at different times in his life. And next slide, please, Joan. Historians have speculated that one other person involved with the period in which trials was possibly gay or whatever the term would be for someone of that time. And that person was William Stoughton of Dorchester. He was the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts during the Salem witch trials. And Stoughton actually presided over the court that tried people during the Salem witch trials. He firmly believed that witches were a real threat and were trying to overthrow the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You'll notice that the early witch trials were quite small, only involving one or two people, while the Salem, Salem trials were enormous. And that's due in large part to William Stoughton. The Puritans believed that witches sent their spirits or their specters out to attack their victims. So only their victims could see these specters, no one else could. For example, I might say, Joan Alacqua has sent her spirit to attack me. And I'd be like, ah, this spirit's attack me. But you would all just see Joan sitting here next to me or sitting in her living room acting totally normal. Obviously, I could just be making this up, right, to falsely accuse Joan of being a witch. I could just be having a hallucination. It could have happened in a dream to me, right? But William Stoughton allowed this type of testimony to be sufficient evidence to find someone guilty of witchcraft. And most court trials did not allow this. And so as a result of William Stoughton allowing this testimony to be sufficient evidence, um, many people convicted and executed during the trials were convicted based solely on this spectral evidence. And the trials really only came to a halt when the governor of Massachusetts, William Phipps, banned spectral evidence. 
I'll just say that overall, William Stoughton does not seem like he was a pleasant person. Um, for example, when 71-year-old Rebecca Nurse was found not guilty of witchcraft during the Salem trials, William Stoughton actually told the jury to go back and rethink their decision, right? Like, go back and get me an answer I like. So she was then found guilty and executed, which is terrible. And at another point in early 1693, right after the trials had ended, William Stoughton tried to execute women who had been convicted of witchcraft, but whose executions had been postponed because they were pregnant. And now that they had given birth to their babies, he wanted to execute them, which again is just terrible. And happily, the governor halted that order and that really infuriated Stoughton and he temporarily stepped down from his political appointments because he was so mad about it. I will say um, that much like John Godfrey though, William Stoughton was a lifelong bachelor, which has led some historians to speculate about his sexuality. Stoughton was trained as a minister, but he did not practice the ministry. Um, and his hometown of Dorchester repeatedly asked him to be their minister, but he refused each time saying he had some objections within himself against the motion, hmm, right? What were these objections he never said? Uh, but the historian Emerson Baker writes that some historians have suggested that his behavior during the Salem trials was evidence that he was misogynist. His bachelor status at least suggests some ambiguities in his relationship with women and even his sexuality. Perhaps this was an issue with which he struggled as he repeatedly found himself unable to serve in his chosen career of minister. So that's from Emerson Baker's book, A Storm of Witchcraft. So there are two possible queer people from the Puritan witch trials, one accused witch, John Godfrey, and one witch trial judge, William Stoughton. So next slide, please. Let's move on to the 18th and 19th century. The Puritans learned from the Salem witch trials that you can't prove witchcraft in a court of law. It's impossible to do. But people in Massachusetts didn't stop believing in witchcraft after the Salem trials ended. They just stopped holding witchcraft trials. So here are some examples showing that people continued to believe in witchcraft. Uh, Abigail Dudley in 1720 in Littleton, Massachusetts. In 1720, three little girls in Littleton started to have fits and exhibit strange behavior. They said they were bewitched and when pressed to identify the witch, they named one of their neighbors, a woman named Abigail Dudley. And the local reverend, reverend happily doubted that the girls were really bewitched. And shortly after this, Mrs. Dudley died giving birth to the, her 13th child, so of natural causes. The matter was dropped. And then eight years later, one of the girls confessed that she had made the whole thing up just to get attention. But many of her neighbors did believe that Abigail Dudley was a witch. And next slide, please. And here's a, a stranger case from 1843. This is more than 150 years after the Salem witch trials. A pepperol man named Absalom Lawrence suspected that his 13 year old daughter was bewitched. She was suffering from strange contortions. She was unable to speak. She wouldn't eat. And then there were also strange phenomena in the house like pots and pans banged when no one was in the kitchen, weird groaning sounds were heard and the butter wouldn't churn. So these are all classic witchcraft symptoms but this is 150 years after the Salem trials. In 1843, no judge would hear a case like this. So Absalom Lawrence hired a wandering hypnotist named Dr. Nevins to help him out. And Dr. Nevins traveled with a female assistant whom he would put into a hypnotic trance. And this assistant identified the witch as an old woman who lived nearby. And the assistant also said the old woman came invisibly on a horse and entered the house through keyholes or cracks under the door. And the assistant noted the invisible horse did not have any horseshoes on its hooves because of course, witches are allergic to horseshoes. But as I said, no judge would hear this case and there was not much that Absalom Lawrence could do even with this information. So eventually he and his family moved to Hollis, New Hampshire and his daughter recovered from the witchcraft attack or alleged witchcraft attack. And just to point out, this story is not a legend. This is not fiction. This is a story that was covered in local newspapers at the time. But cases like Absalom Lawrence's were becoming rare by 1843. Most people in Massachusetts were no longer viewing witches as a dire threat. They were instead something that was entertainingly spooky. There was something to talk about around the fire at night. There was something to scare the children with, right? 
So in the 1700s and 1800s, you tend to see more legends about witches rather than court cases or outright accusations. So witches are slowly becoming more legendary at this point. Next slide, please. The legendary witches, these legendary witches of the 1700s and 1800s, they did the same type of thing they normally did in the Puritan era. They cursed livestock, they caused household problems, etc. They would also appear in men's bedrooms at night and ride the men like horses using a magical witch bridle. And this is a B-R-I-D-L-E, not bridle as in wedding. And accounts of the witch bridle actually go way back to the Puritan witch trials. For example, for example Matthew Harriman of Haverhill testified that Martha Emerson used a magic bridle to ride him like a horse while he slept. And each morning he woke up with his mouth sore from the metal bridle bit in his mouth. So picture like that, you know, metal rod that goes in a horse's mouth. His mouth was sore because he, she was using that bridle on him all night long. I think the sexual imagery here is pretty obvious of the woman, and it's always a woman, riding a man like a horse in their bedroom. And there were a few accounts of witch bridles in the Puritan era, but these stories become much more common in the 19th century. And for some reason, a lot of these stories come from coastal areas, Cape Cod, um, coastal Massachusetts, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And so they often involve witches riding sailors or fishermen like horses. And I don't know why they're found so often in coastal areas, but I found them mostly in coastal areas. So next slide, please. So here are a couple from Cape Cod. Uh, Sylvanus Rich, and that's actually a photo of Sylvanus Rich's grave right there in North Truro Cemetery. Sylvanus Rich was a sea captain from Truro. And one day while sailing north along Truro's Atlantic coast with a shipment of grain bound for Boston, he spies this hut nestled in the dunes in Truro. So he tells his crew to drop anchor because he wants to see if he can get some milk. He's tired of just drinking brackish water and beer on the ship. So he rows out, he rows to the Truro dunes and he rows back to the ship alone and he has this bucket of milk with him. And he says to his crew, that hag in the hut was the ugliest woman I've ever seen, but this milk is the sweetest milk I've ever tasted. Raise the anchor, I'm going to my cabin and I'm gonna drink this milk. As soon as he goes down below decks, a freak storm comes up and it shreds the ship's sails. So the ship is then cast adrift out into the Atlantic with no sails. And the crew is pounding on Sylvanus Rich's door, but he doesn't come out until the morning. And when he comes out, he says, the hag came to me yesterday after I drank her milk. She threw a bridle over my head and rode me up and down the cape like a stallion. Whenever I slowed down, she dug her heels into my sides see? And then he opens up his shirt and his body is covered with bruises shaped like a woman's shoe. So it's very kinky here. Then Captain Rich lowered his shirt and he said, and now I must return to my cabin. She will come again for me tonight and I must prepare. And the crew is not sure if he's like grimacing or is he smiling as he goes to back into his cabin to prepare for the witch. So this goes on for several days. So the ship's drifting in the open sea and each night the witch comes and rides the captain. He's just totally useless, like he's under her spell. Until finally another ship comes by and coincidentally it is Captain Rich's son on that ship. And he somehow snaps his father, father out of the witch's spell. And then they manage to repair the ship. And when Sylvanus Rich finally arrives in Boston with his cargo, the merchant waiting for it asks, why Sylvanus, why is this cargo so late? And Sylvanus Rich says, Blame it on the sweet milk of Satan. And so that's the end of the story. Blame it on the sweet milk of Satan. So I think the sexual vibe there is pretty strong. Um, so there's this grave for a man named Sylvanus Rich in North Truro, uh, North, in the North Cemetery there right on Route 6. He died on July 3rd at the age of 35 in 1755. He did have a son named Isaiah, but Isaiah would have only been 11 when his father passed away and therefore was too young to captain a ship. Um, so I don't know what's true or false in the legend here, but still the fact that there was a man named Sylvanus Rich in Truro suggests that this legend was perhaps based on some faintly remembered incident that did occur. There are other witch bridal, witch riding stories from Cape Cod. For example, a woman from Barnstable named Liza Tower Hill 
was suspected of being a witch. And she supposedly wrote a man named Benjamin Goodspeed while he slept every night. So he tried to escape from her enchantment by boarding a ship. But even out at sea, she found him and rode him every night. So he's just exhausted, right? So finally one evening at sunset, he's standing on the deck of the ship exhausted and he sees this black cat swimming across the ocean towards the ship. And he realizes the cat is Liza Tower Hill coming to ride him again. So he loads some pages from the Bible into his rifle and he shoots the cat with these pages from the Bible. And the cat sinks below the waves with a howl. And in her cabin in Barnstable, Liza Tower Hill kills over dead hundreds of miles away. Liza Tower Hill was a real person. Uh, she died in 1790. She was never put on trial for witchcraft, but there were many, many legends her, about her being a witch. So she definitely had this witchy reputation. And she was someone who was perhaps a little bit outside of normal Barnstable society. And even after her death, people in Barnstable said her ghost lurked in the woods near her ruined cabin, luring men to the devil with her seductive beauty, right? Like she would dance with them in the woods and try to get them to sign their soul over to Satan. These witch bridal stories were very common and some of them even appeared in newspapers in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, for example, the October 10th, 1896 edition of the Boston Evening Transcript contained an article about three witches in an unnamed town north of Boston who all had bridles and they all rode men like horses. And the February 6th, 1919 edition of the Boston Herald had an article about a Truro sailor, again, a sailor from Truro, ridden by a witch because he stole her donuts, right? Don't steal a witch's donuts. And I think all of these stories, again, have some strong sexual overtones to them. Next slide, please. We're moving on from the super sexy part. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, witches became less feared in the 18th and 19th century. There were no witchcraft trials, there were no executions. And you might even find during this time, some women here and there who capitalized on the belief that they were witches, like the Dogtown witches. And Dogtown is now a ghost town in Gloucester, but it was a village that was first established by Gloucester's civic leaders in 1721 to alleviate crowding in the city's coastal area. Everyone was living down near the coast, down near the harbor. So they established this village inland on a stony plateau to kind of move people inland. And they called this the Commons Settlement. That was what it was called, the Commons Settlement. And for many years, the Commons was home to sort of artisans, craftsmen, industry, things like that. Unfortunately, things changed for the worse during the Revolutionary War, when many men from the Commons were called away to fight in the Continental Army. Around the same time, Gloucester's Meeting House, which was the center of its spiritual and civic life, was relocated to a spot much further away from the common settlement. And so because of these two things, the commons quickly changed from an up and coming area to an undesirable backwater that really nobody wanted to live in. As its population dwindled and its houses started to deteriorate, the settlement became known as Dogtown, allegedly for the feral dogs that roamed through its empty streets. And impoverished women and elderly widows who had nowhere else to go, had no place else to live, moved into Dogtown's abandoned houses. And so while the earlier inhabitants had worked as blacksmiths or barrel makers, the new inhabitants of Dogtown made their money as witches. And this would have been a dangerous career choice during the Puritan era, but by the late 18th century, attitudes about witches were changing. So the witch trials had ended by this time, and although many people were still afraid of witches, and some of the Dogtown witches capitalized on this fear, like two women named Molly Jacobs and Luce George, who both worked as fortune tellers, but they threatened to curse anyone who refused their services. So they'd be like, hey, do you want me to read your cards? If you're like, no, they're like, I will curse you. Get in here, I'm gonna read your cards. Um, Luce George's neighbor, Tammy Younger, was the most feared witch in Dogtown. And she lived in a dilapidated house on the main road through Dogtown. And whenever she heard a wagon or a carriage approaching, she would stick her head out the window and threaten to curse the travelers unless they paid her a toll. And her appearance was quite terrifying and she really played it up so business was good so everyone would pay her to avoid her curses. Not all the Dogtown witches were quite so malevolent. 
And tradition says some were actually pleasant and helpful. And some told fortunes using tea leaves or coffee grounds, while others sold a variety of herbal remedies. In addition to women who may have called themselves witches, Dogtown attracted other outcasts from Gloucester society. Several freed slaves also made it their home, including a woman named Old Ruth. And Old Ruth is one of two queer people associated with Dogtown. Old Ruth preferred to wear men's clothing. At first, she said it was because they were more comfortable to work in, but Old Ruth later changed her name to John Woodman. And as John Woodman, John Woodman did a lot of heavy labor in Gloucester and Dogtown, like building fences and stone walls. And some people say that the stone walls that you still see in Dogtown today were all made by John Woodman. John Woodman lived in Dogtown with a nurse named Easter Carter, who was possibly a prostitute or operated a brothel from her decaying house in Dogtown. It's not clear whether their relationship was sexual, romantic, or just platonic between John Woodman and Easter Carter. And sadly, when their house finally collapsed, just decayed from time and it, bad repairs, John Woodman was taken to the Gloucester poorhouse, and he was forced once again to wear women's clothing until his death. Next slide, please. The other person associated with Dogtown was Sammy Stanley. And Sammy was born male, but said he'd been raised by a girl, raised as a girl by his mother. And as an adult, he often wore female attire, particularly a woman's cap and kerchief. He lived in Dogtown with his grandmother and two other older women, including Molly Jacobs, who had a reputation as a witch. And the house, they, the house they were living in also collapsed. It was a common problem in Dogtown, so their house collapsed. And the three older women all were sent to the poorhouse in Gloucester. After this, Sammy Stanley moved to Rockport, and then he wor worked there as a laundress, which is a traditionally a female occupation at the time. And this is actually an image of Sammy Stanley from a booklet about Dogtown from the 1930s. So there are two ostensibly queer people associated with Dogtown, perhaps more. It's hard to say, I think, um, sometimes there are a lot of widowed women involved in witchcraft accounts. So many of those women could have been queer as well. It's just, we don't have as much evidence one way or the other there. So I'll just say the Dogtown population continued to dwindle into the early 19th century and Dogtown finally became completely deserted in 1939 when Cornelius Finson, a freed slave and its last inhabitant died from exposure. And it has been an uninhabited ever since. You can go visit Dogtown, which is now a large park slash conservation area between Gloucester and Rockport. And all that's left of the village today are some cellar holes and some old stone walls. And maybe these were indeed made by John Woodman. If you do visit, I would definitely suggest going with a friend because the terrain can be kind of rough the area is isolated and there have been some violent crimes there in the past. So just be aware of that if you go to visit Dogtown. Next slide, please. And sorry if I'm going, if it's taking me a little longer than I thought. Um, I'll try to talk a little quicker. I think talking about visiting Dogtown is a nice segue to talking about which legends and stories in the 20th and 21st century. People in Massachusetts still tell legends about witches but the legends are less about the cantankerous old neighbor down the street who was a witch, and they're more about places associated with witchcraft in the past, or places haunted by witch hunt victims. And people often go to visit these various places, and certainly I have, like that's one of my hobbies. So, for example, there's a dirt road in North Andover at the intersection of Barker and Bradford Streets that is nicknamed Albino Road, and this road is supposed to be haunted. And according to a local legend, a young couple settled on this land in the late 1600s. They established a small farm and the wife gave birth to twin boys. The boys are born with very pale white skin and pale eyes, right? Pale pink eyes, they were albino. And their parents were afraid the Puritan neighbors would think the boys were some type of monster. So the parents kept these boys hidden away. As the boys grew older, their parents warned them never to leave the farm and to hide if anyone came to visit. Unfortunately, one day in 1692, a neighbor came by unannounced and saw the two boys who were now teenagers. And this neighbor summoned the local constable and the boys were taken into custody. And the town leaders were very concerned, so they devised a test to see if the boys were demons. And so they were tied up and thrown into a lake. And if they sank to the bottom and drowned, they were demons. 
If they floated to the top, they were humans and could be and would be saved. But unfortunately, the two boys sank and drowned, as most people would. And so the town leaders took this as proof they were demons and then burned down the family's farm. And ever since that time, according to legend, two pale ghostly figures haunt the road where the farm once stood. And uh, they hate trespassers and will harm anyone who goes down the road at night. So that's a good spooky story. There is no factual basis to it, I don't think. I think it's purely legend. There's no evidence that there were ever two albino boys accused of being demons. And the story of them being drowned in a pond seems like a garbled version of what's known as the water test, where suspected witches were thrown into a pond to see if they floated. Um, this wasn't practiced in Massachusetts, though. And the albino road story doesn't have the details quite right about how uh, um, the water test worked. And so I have been to Albino Road. This is a photo when I went to visit, but so I'm not going to go down there at night because who knows, maybe it's haunted by something else, right? Who knows? Slide, next slide, please. Now there are also places like the Freetown State Forest in Freetown, Massachusetts. And this is said to be haunted by the ghost of a sexually aggressive witch. So here's again, the sexual aspect of witchcraft. And uh, this story that I'm gonna tell you comes from a book called Dark Woods, Cults, Crime, and the Paranormal in the Freetown State Forest, which was written by an author named Christopher Belzano in 2007. And he interviewed dozens of people who live near the, near, live, uh, he interviewed dozens of people who live near the Freetown State Forest, which is down near Fall River. And he collected their stories of paranormal encounters, ghost stories, etc. So I think it's a great book, very spooky. And, um, if you're interested in a creepy book, it's a good creepy book to read. And I'm going to give a little trigger warning that the story is a little creepy and perhaps sexually uncomfortable, let's say. So one young man named Dave told Christopher Balzano that he and some friends had encountered a witch in the forest when they were boys. And it all began one day when they were out in the woods playing and they heard a woman laughing at them. And they tried to see who it was, but they were unable to see her through the trees. And so the boys ran off because they were scared at this mysterious, almost disembodied laughter. A few years later, when he was 10 years old, Dave had a dream one night that he was an adult man and he murdered his wife in the woods because of her adultery. And he also suspected she was a witch. So that's a pretty freaky dream for a 10 year old boy to have, I will say. Uh, Dave told his friends about this dream and was shocked to learn that the other boys had also dreamed about the same woman several times. And in their dreams, the gray haired woman appeared outside their bedroom windows at night, begging to be let in. The boys continued to have these dreams for years. And one boy made the mistake of opening the window in his dream and letting the strange woman into his bedroom. And uh, his parents ran into his room and they heard his terrified screams. And they were shocked to see their sleeping son struggling in his bed against an invisible assailant. And they, when they woke up, he babbled incoherently about being sexually assaulted by a witch who came in through the window. And so was this just a dream or something else entirely happening here? And he and his family moved out of the neighborhood shortly afterwards this happened. So they just left the area. The other boys continued to see the witch well into their teenage years. And she usually appeared from late September through early October, haunting their dreams and laughing at them in the woods. And the eerie occurrences only stopped when the boys became adults and moved away. There were no records of anyone being accused of witchcraft in Freetown. And the Freetown Historical Society has no records of anyone living in a house in the woods or anything like that. But I will say that the boys' experiences are very similar to classic witchcraft accounts from the 17th to 19th centuries, um, particularly with this sexually aggressive female witch entering the bedroom and um, menacing men, or in this case, young boys. And also interesting, like in Dave's dream, you know, his wife commits adultery and is a witch, which was something we had seen in some of the earlier accounts. So you can see how a legend like this or a paranormal encounter like this kind of evolves some earlier witchcraft narratives in the region. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna wrap up by talking about the witch house in Rockport. There are three buildings, at least three, called the witch house in Massachusetts. One is in Nahant, 
and it is said to be the hiding place of someone accused of witchcraft during the Salem trials. Another witch house is in Salem, and that one is the home of the witch trial judge, Jonathan Corwin. Now the final witch house is in Rockport, and it's also associated with the final queer person that I'll discuss tonight. Now, according to a legend, during the Salem witch trials, Elizabeth Proctor hid in this house in Rockport, which was built by her son. Um, Elizabeth Proctor had been accused of being a witch, so she fled to Rockport and hid in this house. That doesn't seem to be true, though. Elizabeth Proctor was a real person, and she was actually accused of witchcraft probably because she was the wife of John Proctor, the outspoken critic of the Salem trials, who's one of the main characters in the Crucible. However, Elizabeth Proctor didn't flee to Rockport, but she was just instead imprisoned in Salem Village on April 11th without any incident in 1692. And there's also no evidence that Rockport's witch house was built by any of the Proctor children. So it seems likely it was probably built by an early Rockport settler named William Tarr or maybe it was even just built by the entire community as a garrison house for shelter from uh, Native American attacks at that time. So how did Rockport's witch house get its name? Um, I'm not sure. It's possible it was named after a local witch who has since been forgotten, or maybe it was given that name simply because it looked like the type of place a witch might live, i.e. it's old and spooky looking. Or maybe someone just told the legend about Elizabeth, Pro Elizabeth Proctor enough times and the name witch house stuck. It's a little bit of a mystery. Next slide, please. The witch house is also connected to another more recent mystery, and that's the disappearance of Danny Williams, a Harvard student and filmmaker. In 1963, Danny Williams dropped out of Harvard and moved to New York City, where he became involved with the factory, Andy Warhol's sort of circle of avant-garde artists, performers, hangers-on, drug dealers, et cetera. Um, so Danny Williams made several short films for Andy Warhol and also did lighting for concerts by the Velvet Underground. These are famous performances. These are called the Exploding Plastic Inevitable Show. And these are very influential to future rock performances. So uh, Danny Williams did the lighting for those. And Danny Williams was also probably Andy Warhol's lover. And as these photos show, he was an attractive young man. In the summer of 1966, Williams returned to his family's home in Massachusetts, and his family's home was the Rockport Witch House. That's the house they lived in. Williams told his family that he and Warhol had had a falling, had a falling out of some kind. And so if they really were lovers, it seems likely that they broke up. And it seems most likely that Warhol had, damp had dumped Danny Williams. On July 26th, Williams borrowed his mother's car to go for a drive. And that was the last time he was ever seen by his family or by anyone else. The car and Danny Williams clothing were later found near the ocean. And there has been a lot of speculation about what happened to Danny Williams. Some people believe he went swimming and accidentally drowned. Other people believe he committed suicide by drowning. Uh, his body was never found though, which has even led some people to speculate that he staged his own death so he could disappear and start a new life. And he was 27 when he vanished. William's death or disappearance was the topic of a documentary called A Walk Into the Sea, which was made in 2007 by his niece, but the case has never been solved. And even that documentary contains many conflicting reports about what happened while he was in Andy Warhol's circle and afterwards as well. And next slide, please. So that wraps up my presentation tonight. I think in closing, I'll just say that legends and stories like this help us remember historic events, right? They help us remember the people who lived here before us. And I think they can help us find our queer ancestors as well if we look closely enough. And again, if you wanna read more stories about witchcraft in Massachusetts, please check out my book, which is in Warlocks of Massachusetts, which is available online everywhere you would normally buy books. And so now I think we have some time for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Peter. That was so much fun. Um, I will say we, let's take maybe five for questions. I know we're going a little bit longer than we usually do, but I think, 
um, that's okay if folks want to stick around. Uh, if you would like to ask Peter a question, feel free to use the hand raise function, or if you're on video, you can wave at me and I'll make sure that we unmute you. But I can kick us off with a question from the chat if we sure. are ready. I'm so ready. Jim, Jim asked um, what, way back when we were talking about uh, Martha Corey, um, Jim asked if her transgression was worse or not because of the race of the man that she had slept with prior to being married married so right. does his you know his blackness have something to do with how she was treated or was that typical of unwed mothers during the time i uh, being an unwed mother was bad right that was just bad enough so i and i don't know enough about um race at the time to really speak to it but i would say that the puritans were not tolerant of people who were not English Puritans, right? They were not tolerant of the few Irish people. They were not tolerant of Native Americans. They were not tolerant of Quakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would assume that having a child out of wedlock with a black man would have been considered a major transgression, right? But I'm not 100% sure, but I'm assuming. But also it's interesting that her subsequent husbands adopted this son and brought him into the family, right? And that was, and so they were willing to overlook it or accept him as a valued member of the family. So there's maybe the positive side of Puritan society also. Great. And then Kelly also asks in the chat about Elise Smith from Windsor, Connecticut. Um, and Kelly is asking, can you talk about Elise related to the woman executed in Springfield, Mass for witchcraft? I don't know enough about Elise Smith to answer this one, but um, Kelly, if you want to email me, go to my blog and my email address is there and we can talk offline. And there was somebody from Springfield who was sent to Boston to be executed, um, a woman named Mary Parsons. It's not clear if she actually was executed or if she died in prison from sickness because there's no record of her death. So she was found guilty of witchcraft, sent to Boston to be executed, but there's no actual trial, no actual record that she was executed, that it was carried out. So she may have just died from illness in prison, which is not great either, to be honest, let's face it. So. Mm. So I have, as folks may still be writing their questions in the chat or thinking about what they want to ask, I'm kind of curious about witches' bridles. And so okay. I, I sort of had two thoughts relating to this question. One, are they, you know, do you think the story is related to the, the idea of like the wild hunt, like that the fairies are going to come and take you on the hunt and then you're trapped doing this? So that's part one of my question. But part two is, where are they riding them to? You know, if, if they're saying all they're riding the me up and down the coast and all over the place and on the ships and like, they're just, yeah. are they going somewhere? <laughs> In some stories, they're riding them to a witch meeting, right? Um, like Liza Tower Hill sometimes was said to ride her men to Plymouth, where the witches would gather in Plymouth to have the big witch meetings. In other cases, though, they're just riding the men almost as a form of punishment. And some of these stories, the men have stolen from the witch, right? Like this man stole this witch's donuts in Truro. And so then the witch rides him just over and over and over till he's exhausted. So some of them have this kind of punitive aspect, like the men have harmed the women and the women want to get their punishment and they do it by riding them like a horse. And there is tradition of like, um, you know, from England, fairies riding horses, right? If you come out into the barn at night, it, you've come out to the barn in the morning and your horse's mane is all tangled up. That's because it was written by, ridden by a fairy or a goblin or something like that. And you can also tie it into something like, um, like the nightmare, right? A nightmare was like a demonic horse that comes at night, night hag. There are these, all these sort of connected concepts there. Even some people talk about sleep paralysis. Um, you hear that sort of a modern explanation that some of these witchcraft stories were actually a form of sleep paralysis where people wake up and they're unable to move. And then you sort of see this figure come into the room and who is that figure? And people now will say like, it's an alien or it's a werewolf or something. 
but people in the Puritan era would say it was a witch, right? A witch came into my room and she did these things to me. And they supposedly, <clears throat> uh, I think it was the town north of Boston I mentioned in 1896, they supposedly found a witch, witch's bridle in the wall of a house. Like people working in the house ripped down the plaster and found this witch's bridle made out of birch bark and animal hair and things like that. So I don't know. Fun. And so um, and in the chat, just to read out loud, uh, one person says, never steal a witch's donuts, that they were cider donuts. Yeah, don't um, do it. Don't do it. Someone else mentioned the writing implies, you know, a contradiction to uh, proper sexual position uh, or, or yeah. role, roles in the bedroom. Um, and I'm going to use uh, Elliot's question as, as sort of our final question tonight. And Elliot asks, um, uh, also about the witch's bridal, it has this fairly obvious sexual connotation. And um, this is where they get a little lewd. Is there any indication of whether or not this is related to this transgression of sodomy that uh, the Puritans were, you know, corporally punishing people for? It's interesting. Um, like I didn't find in all the stories I read any direct overlap between sodomy and witchcraft. There's direct overlap between like fornication, adultery, abortion, things like that in witchcraft. I didn't find anybody accused of sodomy who was also accused of being a witch. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question or not, but I didn't, I didn't find that. Um, and I think, you know, what people were executed for during the witch trials, definitely like the witch riding, the witch bridal is there in the background, but it was more often like killing people right, or causing them great physical pain or ruining crops. I think they took those things much more seriously than so the witch bridal. And it's in, like the witch bridal stuff does really become more prevalent later in the 1700s and 1800s, where people I think could talk about witches without quite so much fear and maybe even enjoy some of the, ooh, ooh the titillating semi-sexual, like, oh, this, which rode this lusty young sailor up and down Cape Cod all week or I mean, you know, even as you say it, it's like, it sounds like, it sounds like sex, right? It sounds like sex, so. All right, well, I think if we have any other questions for Peter or if we think of any questions later, I encourage everyone to go check out his blog at newenglandfolklore.blogspot.com. There are some fun features on uh, haunted gay bars in Boston. That's one of my favorites. Um, and otherwise, I just want to say thank you so much, Peter, for being here with us tonight, for kicking off. Uh, it's officially spooky season now, now that we've had this talk tonight. Um, and thank you all so much for uh, being here in our audience tonight and for sticking through it <laughs> past eight o'clock. Usually I try to get people out of here because it's still a school night, um, but I appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of the History Project, thank you all for being here, and uh, we will be in touch with info about some of our upcoming events. I can tease, we haven't announced yet, we'll be doing one on uh, queer connections in Dracula, so if, if witches are your thing and vampires are your thing, we'll see you again in October for, for another event in this series. Otherwise, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.